new on Curiosity Stream. I'm James Burke. I'm going to take you on a journey through time. James Burke's visionary series returns, reimagined for our time. Now, this is all uncharted territory. The Washington Post hails Burke as one of the most intriguing minds in the Western world. The New York Times raves he careens from one great moment in history to another. Where do we want to go from here? Experience all new connections. So what's the next connection? With monthly, annual, and bundled plans, find the one that works for you at curiositystream.com. With no fees or minimums and no overdraft fees, banking with Capital One is the easiest decision in the history of decisions. Even easier than choosing to keep the Grinch away from the toy drive. Who's going to deliver the toys to the kids? What about me, the Grinch? No. Yep, even easier than that. You steal the presents one time. With no fees or minimums and no overdraft fees, is it even a decision? That's banking reimagined. What's in your wallet? Terms apply. Capital One NA member FDIC. Copyright Dr. Seuss Enterprises. Copyright Turner Entertainment Company. Welcome to Pretty Lies and Alibis. Let's seek the truth and travel the long road to justice together. What you know, alibiers. Welcome to another episode of Pretty Lies and Alibis. I'm Gigi. Hope you're doing well today. Um, real quick, I just want to give a big, big thank you to Patricia for the very generous donation. It is greatly appreciated. And our music fact of the day kind of crosses into movie fact or trivia. Billy Holiday used to babysit Billy Crystal. In fact, she was the one that took him to his very first movie. His dad and his uncle were the co-founders of Commodore Records, and that label recorded and released her album Strange Fruit after Columbia Records deemed it too sensitive. And also, being childless, um, it is said that she would just offer to babysit people's kids for fun. I think that's a really cool fact there. Um, Okay, so what I'm going to do today is kind of go back, and this is going to be maybe a mini episode, not quite as long as we've been going, but I was going through my notes and going through police interviews, and I realized that there were some things in Melanie Gibbs' interview from April 30th of last year that I didn't incorporate into the timeline, and some of it's relevant. So I think uh, that's what I want to do today is just kind of finish this interview out. Now, before we get started, y'all, Melanie Gibb chose the loudest water bottle to bring to this this interview. And, like, finally, she just starts trying different angles and, like, tilts her head different to see if she can get it... um, get it to be not so loud, but she never succeeded. It just sounded like you're trying to suck that tiny bit of water that is barely in there. But man, I mean, I mean, look, maybe it's late and I'm just, you know, things make me laugh, but it was just, she was slurping away. And at one point she's like, I'm not sure why this is so loud. Okay. So At the very beginning of this interview, now, by the way, there are detectives from Rexburg in Chandler at Chandler PD to interview her. Hermesio was there, and I, I can't, I can't think of the other detective. I know him. It might come out in a minute. I'm sorry. So she lets them know that she is married now, and contrary to the gossip out there, they are not separated. And then she goes on to say that people like online people know more about herself than she does. And um, so the investigators and Gibb talk about how this case has consumed people's lives. Um, Guilty. Yeah. And uh, Gibb says she tells people just not to tell her what they've heard. So he said talking to other people has raised more questions and they need to figure out what's going on. So he says they're trying to block off any avenue someone could say, hey, you haven't checked that out. Now, here's the thing. This I'll have to go back and check my dates, and I didn't before I did this, but this was April 30th of 2021. If I'm not mistaken, I think maybe the grand jury convened shortly after that in May. So maybe this was just kind of tightening up loose ends with her and kind of, you know, let her know... Uh, some things that they might come after her about. And 
one thing she says, you know what I heard? I don't follow me. I don't look up any, any information about what people say about me. Don't want to know, don't care. But somebody told me, and you know, you and David were married on 1212. And she put it, it's like 12 times 12 equals 144, which she equated to 144,000. And she like puts her hand on her head and she's like, she had never put that together. And then she also mentions that Alex died on 12, 12. So they start talking a little bit. We had covered some of this interview. So I'm jumping to the parts where we didn't cover. She said Zulema texted her to see if she was up for a conversation. This is after Alex had died, by the way. This was just a couple of days after he dropped over. And Zulema texted and asked her if she was up for a conversation because the bishop had told her uh, what happened. And she said she was so surprised, so sad. I'm so sorry. Words can express how I feel. I'm only extremely surprised at your hypocrisy because of what you did by going to the police. I didn't only have to deal with my precious husband dying in my arms but when police ransacked my house and traumatized my entire family, you're not my friend. <laughs> you're not going to speak to anyone in my family again. I want, okay, so long story short, Melanie's sold a piano for $2,000. And Melanie Gibb was the one who got that money. So Zulema says, I want you to pay the $2,000 you owe as soon as possible put it under the mat, and forget that I exist. The detective asked Zulema um, if Zulema thought Gibb put them on Alex's trail, meaning was with her going to the police, was she the one saying Alex Cox, you know? And Gibb said she thought so, and that's why Zulema was so mad at her. So Gibb put the money under the mat, and she said that was it. She saw Zulema a couple of times after that at the temple, but Zulema didn't say anything to her, wouldn't talk to her. And Gibb said the temple got closed shortly after. And I'm not trying to be funny, but I hope they did something in there to rid that place of whatever hoodoo voodoo they brought in there. Uh, Gibb said a friend of hers saw Zulema at the temple after Alex died. And Zulema said, oh, Kelly, my husband died. Can you see him? He's here with me. And Gibb said Zulema was deceived so much, and it's so sad talking about Alex. Gibb said that Zulema's energy work also got her roped in and deceived because she could communicate through the veil. And the investigator asked Gibb, do you think she really can communicate through the veil? And Gibb kind of stops for a minute and says, I don't know if people make stuff up or not, honestly. She said, I do believe people can see things. I think that's possible. But my feeling about them is I think they can conjure up feelings and thoughts. Then she starts talking about how her and Lori would sit in the temple and hold hands because they loved each other. And Lori would say, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Mother came to me right here. And she would point up to the, like, right above her. And I was like, I didn't think she was lying in the temple. Girlfriend. You knew Lori and Chad said they got sealed in the temple. You think she won't lie to you in there? Gibb said on the eternal side, she thought God wanted her to be a witness to all this, and somebody needed to witness all this craziness and truth. Y'all, she's backpedaling at like a 1,000 miles an hour. She's just going back. She said there's a part of her that's very innocent because she didn't think Lori was lying to her and she said she wouldn't make a good police officer Gib because she would think everybody who came in was telling the truth and then she says she compares it to looking back on her ex-husband saying oh yeah that's manipulation she said I didn't catch it because I don't know how to do it I don't understand it but when you experience it it's painful the investigator asked about her marriage prior to Chad and Lori, and she said it was plagued with problems. Then the investigator asked if Chad and Lori encouraged her to separate, and she said, actually, it was the opposite. They discouraged it. And she said, Chad saw Gib and her family in a vision go into a mountain in camps, and I see your husband and your family with you. 
But then Chad sees her husband get upset and leave the camp, and then he dies shortly after that. So I wonder if he had a big fat insurance policy or they thought maybe he did. Another time, Chad said Gibbs' ex-husband wasn't dark, but he had dark spirits around him. So Chad said he took the attachments off of her ex-husband, Brendan. And Gibbs said, I didn't ask him to do that, nor did I think he had them. And she said this happened right kind of in the beginning when they all started hanging out. She remembers around this time is when she met Lori, and she remembers standing with her husband and said to him, if you don't stop talking to me this way, I can't do this anymore. And she's, she randomly says her ex starts scratching his arm because he has eczema. I mean, poor Brendan. Now the whole world knows you got the itchies, buddy. Now that stuff's no joke, but still. Um, she asked Heavenly Father if she had to do this anymore being in the marriage. And she said she had a piece about it. And Lori told her one day in the temple she should go back to him. Um, but she said she told Brendan, her husband, the whole story after all, all this and after she had talked to the police because she started to figure out the media was going to pick up on it and she was going to be the subject of some of it. And she also felt with him being the father of her kids, she owed him that. And he was shocked and said, probably a good thing you divorced me because they probably would have come after me like they did Brandon. And he's probably not wrong there. Um, She's asked if she ever felt that Chab was trying to bring her into a relationship with him, like a romantic one. And she said no, but one time he did contact her on Messenger about six months before she met Lori and said, hey, Melanie, I just finished my last book and I'm going to be in Arizona. Do you think you could help me put together a get together? And Gibbs said she would love to. So she contacted Jason Mao. And said, hey, Chad's coming into town. Why don't you guys get together and do a duo? And Mal said that was fine. So Gib kind of helped spread the word, Chad and Jason Mal, we're going to do something. Gib said she picked him up from the airport, but she had um, someone in the car. And that person had her kid. And she says, phew, I'm glad because who knows. They went to the event afterwards, and she asked if he could give her a priesthood blessing because she could really use one. Now, remember, she was talking about the priesthood blessing not too long ago, saying, well, he wasn't authorized to give those, but she asked for one when her boyfriend had the bad dream on the 22nd, the night JJ was murdered, and then now she's asking him for a blessing, so... She said at the time, um, she really looked up to him and thought he was a great visionary, but she doesn't think he's a great visionary now. She said, he gave me a nice little blessing, and she said he didn't come on to her, and she thinks he used her to get his books sold there. Of course, I never had any type of interest in him at all, and she said when he met Lori, it was a totally different energy than when she had met him. So they move on to the night that JJ's murdered, and Alex, Alex comes in with JJ and goes upstairs. And the detective asked, do you know where he went when he took him upstairs? And Gibbs said, into Lori's room, because he wasn't in the rooms that her and David were staying in, so it had to have been Lori's room. So Alex left, and JJ was still in Lori's room. So the investigator asked again, he brought JJ in, but he didn't leave with him, and Gibbs said no. So the investigator talks about David's bad dream, Remember, we talked about this. She tries to text Lori and Chad, couldn't get an answer, tries to call. She goes down the hall, tries to jiggle the door. It's locked. And she got no response. And she also, you know, just nothing. So she said they went back to bed, and then the next morning, Lori was happy chippy. And um, I think that's interesting because we don't know a lot of specifics about the kids' murders. We don't know where they took place, but it is certainly um, curious that she saw Alex take JJ upstairs to Lori's room. According to Gibbs, she couldn't get the door open, couldn't get anybody to answer or text their phones or knocks or whatever. And it's the night that sweet boy is murdered. So, um, so Chad's explanation of David Warwick's badgy dream <laughs> And Julie Rowe attacked him in his dream. <laughs> you know, I'm so sorry, but literally, like, Julie Rowe is the excuse for every bad things that 
happens to these people. So the investigator asked if Chad said that or Lori, and then she said probably Lori, but they always agreed, but she did say Chad at first. She also said earlier that day they went to that property that was going to be for sale, and they actually talked to a friend of Julie Rose named Keith who was there with his wife, and the realtor was also there. Alex was there. David said Lori was there, but Gibbs said she was not. She went home after, she said after then, and she didn't elaborate where then was. And David said, oh, I forgot that. Gibbs said they all thought Julie's friend Keith would tell Julie they were all there because they're thick as thieves. The investigator asked what Lori was wearing the morning that they got up to leave Rexburg. And she said Lori was typical Lori in a spandex shirt and pants most likely. The investigator wanted to know if it was the same clothes from the night before and Gibb didn't remember. So Hermosillo asked about the 22nd, which is a Sunday. That's, that's when JJ, um, you know, was murdered. He asked if Lori went anywhere with JJ and Gibb doesn't remember her leaving. But then we've talked about this too. The text at 8.30 p.m. that evening before they did the podcast where she texted Gibb, that JJ woke up and she would be there shortly because she was getting him back to bed. So Gib doesn't even remember the text and doesn't know where Lori was when she sent it, but maybe she kind of assumed Alex's townhouse. Now, here's the thing. Gib didn't remember it, but Hermosillo clearly has those records, and um, I'm sure those records will tell a story at trial, all of them. Then Gibb said they didn't start the podcast until late. So it had to have been before they started when she got that text from Lori. And then she said, you know, again, her guess would be that Lori was at Alex's house. Hermosillo asked um, asked about David wanting to see JJ the morning that he left. And then he asked if they talked about JJ on the way home. And Gibb said, why would we talk about JJ, essentially? And this was interesting because Hermosillo really kind of was going somewhere with this and Gibb had no clue. Hermosillo said, well, David did question the zombie thing or did he think it was made up? And and Gibb said, no, he's pretty serious guy. He thought it was real. So Hermosillo essentially was just questioning if, if, you know, if David really thought that JJ could have potentially been a zombie, don't you think that's something you would have talked about on the way home? And she really didn't answer. And then Hermosillo reminds her that she made three to four calls to Lori on the drive home and asks if she remembers the context of any of those calls. And Gibb makes a joke about them jogging her memory, saying it's been a long time ago. And she said it may not have been anything significant, but she said it's possible they talked about it. So I thought that was weird. It, I I guess that's open-ended. It, to me, in the context of what they were discussing at this point in the interview, would maybe be about JJ. And to me, I think you would remember if you're talking, you know, about a kid who, who's supposedly a zombie. So um, she said it's possible Lori talked about those things because it um, seemed to be on her mind all the time. The investigator asked prior to the podcast if Chad was there, and Gibb said yes. She said uh, she was asked when he left, and she said he was there the day she got there or the next day, and him and Lori were doing their little music thing, so I don't know if they were singing like, um, you know, like, what's that song by the Black Eyed Peas, Can't Get Enough Together or whatever. They were doing their music thing. Oh, man, I wish there were a video of that. Um, And... He, she was asked when he left. And Gibbs said that, um, oh, I'm sorry. They walked around the track another day, and she knows he was there that Sunday on the 22nd because he interacted with David, and she remembers Chad being in the kitchen. But Gibbs said he always wanted to go home not to upset Tammy. At least Gibbs said she had that feeling as to why he didn't want to stay late. And he was not there when they did that podcast. So Gibbs said, I bet you know more than me after seeing the text. And she said that Lori and Chad were always texting. The investigator asked again about Chad being there on the 22nd. And Gibbs said, there's a high probability he was. It's a little different. Now, 
At one point, she's got him pegged in the kitchen, and now there's a high probability. So the day Gibb and David left, Lori cut and colored Gibb's hair, and they started out in Lori's bedroom. But Lori said it's easier in the bathroom downstairs, so they went there. Um, But Gibb said it was odd to her because all of Lori's stuff she used to do her hair was upstairs in her bedroom. And she added the cut was off a little bit. Um, And she said something about boxes and that JJ was trying to cut them. So I don't know if that's something that Lori talked about when she was doing her hair. So Hermesio asked Gibb if she 100% believed in multiple probations, and she said it probably sounded like I did, but there was always a question mark. She said she tried to believe it, and he confirms that her spiritual name was Phoebe, and Lori said she was a descendant of Joseph Smith, and her name was Mary Smith. And Phoebe, a.k.a. Melanie Gibb, was the oldest of all of her kids, and Christina was a kid of hers as well in that same probation. Hermesio said, Lori was your mom, and Gibb said, yeah. And Hermesio, I love him. He, he's so, like, um, unintentionally kind of pointed, or it's intentional, but I, I just love it. Because he said, <laughs> because there were times you called her mom. And <laughs> Gibb said, did I believe it 100%? Uh, look, I mean, it was funny because there were times you called her mom. Okay, look, I'm just going to say it. That is weird. That is odd. I would never call, like, my friend mom. That's so weird. Yeah, girl, you were all up in that stuff. Hermesio said the defense is probably going to touch on this because it seems you were close to Lori more than anyone in that group, including Zulema. And Gibb said, yes, that's true. And Hermesio said, they're going to hit on that, like the Ned Schneider and Charles being shorter. There were some texts about that. So he said they're manipulative, but we want to get ahead of it. So Gibb said, I know it sounds like I believed it, but can you believe something 100%? She said she does remember uh, Lori mentioning about JJ crawling up in those cabinets. So I just wanted to finish that little bit on Gib because we just really got finished um, a few episodes ago with that night, and it kind of surrounds the time where her and David were there. And I know I pulled a few things in we talked about, but just it was um, her body language and the way she vocalized things, it was almost like she was kind of laughing and almost using her voice almost convinced these investigators that she didn't believe. And like, I'm going to tell you right now, her Masio sitting there sometimes like, she's just like this and she's talking and she's very animated. And he was just, he's just like staring at her. And I, I, man, I, I give a penny for that dude's thoughts. But anyway, so this just really, really quick, wanted to finish that up. She has a couple of more interviews between East Idaho news. And then, um, Another police interview. We still haven't gotten into Zulema. So we've got a lot of stuff coming up. Um, So anyways, just wanted to put this out there. Hope you have a good rest of your day. And um, yeah, we'll see you soon. With no fees or minimums and no overdraft fees, banking with Capital One is the easiest decision in the history of decisions. Even easier than choosing to keep the Grinch away from the toy drive. Who's going to deliver the toys to the kids? What about me, the Grinch? No. Yep, even easier than that. You steal the presents one time. With no fees or minimums and no overdraft fees, is it even a decision? That's banking reimagined. What's in your wallet? Terms apply. Capital One NA member FDIC. Copyright Dr. Seuss Enterprises. Copyright Turner Entertainment Company. Why don't more infant formula companies use organic, grass-fed whole milk instead of skim? Why don't more infant formula companies use the latest breast milk science? Why don't more infant formula companies run their own clinical trials? Why don't more infant formula companies use more of the proteins found in breast milk? Why don't more infant formula companies have their own factories instead of outsourcing their manufacturing? We wondered the same thing. So we made Byheart a better formula for formula. Learn more at byheart.com.